countryside and through busy French towns like this one. Specifically, we are in the agricultural region of La Beauce, which the French call the Granary of France. Geographically, we are not too far from Paris, about an hour by train, but there is very little to suggest Paris here. We're in one of those quiet sections that establish the deepest character of France. We are, so to speak, at one of the roots that over the ages have fed the great flowering of French culture and civilization. More specifically, we are in the city of Chartres, the capital of this granary of La Beauce. We are in the older and lower part of the city. Beyond us, the river flows beneath an escarpment that rises in terraces to one of the great structures of the world, the Cathedral of Chartres a supreme expression of mystical faith, a towering synthesis of medieval intellectualism, and a magnificent feat of engineering. Faith, intellect, and engineering. These three elements may seem a contradictory combination. Certainly mystical faith would seem a complete contradiction of intellectual analysis. And what about the practical business of engineering, the matter of getting this tremendous piece of masonry to stand as it has done for centuries? That would seem incidental to the religious and intellectual expression that the cathedral serves. And yet the glory of the Gothic cathedral, with Chartres as its finest example, is that these three elements were perfectly fused. What we want to do in this film, what we will try to do, is to see through the eyes of medieval man what the cathedral means and how these elements were fused in it so that it remains one of the most noble, one of the most inspired, and one of the most daring structures ever created by man. The Cathedral of Chartres, dedicated more than seven centuries ago, is not a dead monument to a forgotten age. It is very much alive. The city itself is prosperous and modern. But the cathedral remains its heart. Its spires rise in benign majesty above the bustle of everyday life. The vista of an ordinary business street 
suddenly opens into a view of the cathedral. Visually, all of this is picturesque, but the picturesque is not always significant. In this case, the physical relation of the French cathedral to the city around it is significant. The wonderful, the miraculous, the divine, and every detail of the life of men on earth in the Middle Ages were unified into a single philosophical whole, and the cathedral was its visible expression. The cathedral was medieval thought in visible form. Thus it was appropriate that the life of the town should press close to the cathedral, and that the cathedral should at once embrace the town and be embraced by it. But what is the special character of Chartres Cathedral, that it should be called the greatest of the medieval churches? Many people are puzzled by their first glimpse of the west front. The entrance portals seem too small in relation to the great bulk of the building. The spires do not match. Chartres does not have the architectural unity of the Cathedral of Amiens, the most consistent of the Gothic cathedrals, the purest example stylistically in all its parts. Nor does Chartres have the immediate attractiveness of the Cathedral of Reims, a breathtaking fabrication of lace in stone. Nor, for that matter, does Chartres Cathedral have the four-square power of Notre Dame in Paris. Or half the familiar historical and literary associations of this cathedral. By comparison, the west front of Chartres may seem curiously unbalanced and somewhat stark. Yet there are reasons for its inconsistencies. The cathedrals of Amiens, Reims and Paris were built over relatively brief periods of time. But what we have seen so far of Chartres cuts across several hundred years of architecture and sculpture. The present ground plan dates largely from the 13th century. But in the 9th century, the church of Chartres consisted only of this small portion outlined in black, remains of which are still to be found in the crypt. In the 11th century, however, this church burnt down, and by the 12th, a larger one was built, which may have looked something like this. And part of this church, more than 800 years old, is the Romanesque entrance portal, which by present-day architectural standards seems too cramped and narrow for the bulk of the cathedral. A.D. 1194. Another great fire destroys most of the church, and reconstruction has begun in a new style, the Gothic. Two large porches are added, and 60 years later, the new cathedral is dedicated. The church of 1260 is very nearly as we see it today, except for one obvious difference. In 1506, the north spire was destroyed by fire, and a new one, in a very different style, 
was built in its place. Thus, the two spires are separated by a matter of some 250 years. Years that saw the change from the strong early Gothic style to the more elaborate, graceful late Gothic. When this spire was built in the 16th century, it was built in the then current style. But it was designed in what might be called psychological balance with the older, more solid steeple. Although it is taller, it is also airier, lighter in design. The lines of the early Gothic tower lead upward with only minor interruptions. And as the spire tapers, it finally reaches the tip where, in effect, the material world vanishes. The new tower, with its more complicated architecture, serves the same purpose more elaborately. In contrast with the solidity of the older steeple, there is a complexity of ornamental forms. As we leave the base of the tower, the stone begins to open up, almost as if it were flowering. As the tower rises, the stone seems to dissolve into thin air, its forms curling and twisting into space. The cathedral spire to medieval men symbolized the escape of the spirit, of the soul, from the burden of material existence. In its great mass and in its individual parts, the Gothic cathedral is a symbol. Here at the feet of Christ are to be found the beasts of the apocalypse, symbolizing Christ's triumph over the evils of the world. There are many other examples of symbolism to be found in the sculptural details of the cathedral. Carved on the embrasures of the south porch, we find figures which represent the virtues and vices of mankind. Pride, which even today goeth before a fall. The virtue of chastity, that of wisdom, and strength, meaning moral strength, is symbolized by the figure of a knight, but what earthly object could symbolize for medieval man the mystery which was ultimate for him? The mystery of God. Certainly no tangible object could do so. Nothing he might see or touch, or for that matter carve or construct, could be so all-embracing as he conceived God to be. Thus the symbol for God became space, the space within which everything exists, men, sun, stars, cathedrals, space which medieval man could neither see nor touch, but which was for him, like God, the ultimate reality and at the same time the ultimate mystery. We must understand this concept of mysterious space if we are to understand cathedral architecture. For modern man, space no longer means an ultimate mystery, but something knowable, something to be conquered. curious ways and by curious coincidence, the structures we build to launch our space rockets have some of the upward striving look of a cathedral. But here, the resemblance ends. Missile blasts.
blasts from the earth, it represents not a release from the world into the mysterious, but rather the death of the mysterious, the unknown made known. This, then, is the difference between medieval man and modern man. Medieval man thought of knowledge as something that led up to the point of the ultimate mystery that was revealed only to the soul after death. Modern man, scientific man, thinks of knowledge as something expandable until it can explain the mysteries to the intellect on this earth. The symbol of modern man is the laboratory. The summary of medieval man is the cathedral. And as the summary of all knowledge in the service of God, the cathedral illustrates its thesis with sculpture. Ready, ready. cathedral is sometimes called the Bible of the poor. But in fact, the scheme for the sculptural decoration of the cathedral was worked out by the scholars of the church and was an intellectual demonstration that all history, all knowledge and everything that we see in the world, every fragment of it, could be organized into a proof of the Christian dogma. The cathedral was a gigantic symbol of the universe as it was known in the Middle Ages. Thus, in the arches, around a representation of Christ's ascension to heaven, we see ordinary people going about their daily tasks. Above them, the stars wheel through the heavens, symbolized by signs of the zodiac. Elsewhere, we see an ancient Greek philosopher, Aristotle. The ascension of Christ into heaven the tasks of mankind carried on beneath the stars, an ancient Greek philosopher, all to medieval men were part of the divine mystery. The reality of this world was proof of another world. Fact and faith were one. <laughs> Cathedrals face west where it was believed the last trumpet would sound, signifying the end of the world. Here above the west portal at Chart, Christ is shown in majesty, surrounded by symbols of the four evangelists, Matthew and Mark, Luke and John. The embrasures of this entrance, called the royal portal, are lined with figures identified as the legendary ancestors of Christ, the kings and queens of Judah. Their rigid frontality, their long attenuated lines, are typical of the sculptural style of the 11th century. But their unyielding formality, which might seem oppressive or forbidding, 
is relieved by the compassionate humanity of the heads. Noble and reserved, the kings and queens of Judah are also warmly human. <laughs> on the sides of the cathedral, giving in to the transepts, are larger, deeper, and architecturally more elaborate. This later architectural style is reflected also in the sculpture, in which forms are fuller, more various. The attitudes are less rigid, proportions are more realistic. But realism is a relative term and does not exclude high idealism. This can be seen in the figure of the warrior, Saint Theodore, as represented on the south portal. His features seem to be those of an individual, perhaps the portrait of some young man who suggested for the sculptor the masculine force and the dedication of spirit of those who served the church. Clad in a knight's tunic over chain mail, he is a figure out of the age of chivalry. In his worldly character, he is the knight who serves his lady in the joust. As a spiritual symbol, he serves the virgin, vanquishing the forces of evil through worldly action. For a direct comparison of the change in styles, here again are the earlier figures of the royal portal. The attenuated lines broken by swirls of cloth used as elements of design, give these figures almost the quality of columns. In the later period, the 13th century, the cloth of the gowns is more representational, falling as cloth does fall. The figures stand more naturally. The features, though idealized, are those of individual human beings. But the increased realism of the 13th century was appropriate to the Gothic conception of weaving this world and the heavenly one into a single fabric. Saints pictured so familiarly as men, although men of uncommon spirituality, testified to the unity of the divine scheme. This is seen also in the statue of Christ teaching on the pier of the central door of the south porch. This is a Christ whose divinity and humanity are perfect counterparts in the medieval Christian concept of the savior of mankind. As the monument we've seen from the outside, Chartres is the outer surface of a shell that defines the creation of space within. The sculpture clustered around the portals is glorious and summarizes in stone the faith of the Middle Ages. But it is only a preparation for entering the cathedral itself. In 
the mystery of its vast spaces, in the miracle of its glowing lights, the stained glass, the interior of Chartres, like the exterior, is a summary of the tenets of medieval faith. Like the sculpture, the stained glass was an elaborate compendium of symbols worked out by the clergy and told the stories of the Old and New Testaments, recounted the lives of the saints, glorified the Virgin, traced the lineage of Christ. And there shall come forth a rod out of the root of Jesse, and a flower shall rise up out of his root, and the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. And there was a rainbow round about the throne, in sight like unto an emerald. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. when few people could read and services were conducted in Latin. The stained glass windows, like the sculpture on the exterior, could be read by the unlettered. But while Gothic man was no doubt inspired by the lives of the saints pictured in glowing colors, this was not the primary function of the windows. The stained glass controlled the intensity of light as it penetrated the cathedral, deepening, and intensifying the mysteries of the vast space. The space which, symbolizing God, encompassed the Gothic universe. engineering. Thus far we have seen the perfect fusion in the medieval cathedral of faith and intellect, but the cathedral is also a triumph of engineering. The medieval builder could not depend on faith to keep his great walls and vaults from collapsing. engineer, the Gothic builder devised an enormous ribbed cage in which no part is self-supporting. Each part is held in balance by another. Buttresses press inward against vaults. Vaults press outward against buttresses in a system of thrust and counter-thrust. Thus the logic of engineering creates mystery. For the end effect is mysterious. Through the logical use of the unmiraculous material of stone, medieval man created a visible mystery, symbol of his God.